and welcome to the fourth practice in the 30 day yoga asana challenge. Today we're going to look at Chaturanga Dandasana, commonly referred to as the plank, although meaning literally the forelimb stick pose. So the spine in the forelimb stick pose is uh, the stick and obviously the arms and the legs are the four limbs. Um, the plank position obviously has um, a great deal of currency in popular culture, popular fitness. Uh, it's seen as a marker of somebody's strength or somebody's endurance. However, we need to be aware of the fact that Chaturanga Dandasana, whilst it might look very similar to the uh, fitness plank position or the push-up position, isn't actually a straightforward push-up position. Um, it might be closer to a triceps press-up, um, but that's the one that's a lot harder to do, um, which fewer people actually do do. Perhaps because uh, we see the plank quite a lot in fitness routines, it doesn't for me carry quite the same um, spiritual atmosphere as many of the yoga practices. Um, I'm probably wrong in feeling this because the, the length through the spine, the clearance of stretch through the spine in a really quite demanding position calls on the body's strength and that whilst the body uh, rises to the challenge of the strength that is required from the plank, it energises itself and at the same time the spine energises in this really lengthened straight position. So the, the pranic energy, the life energy can be very strong in Chaturanga Dandasana, so it's quite a yang life energy practice. Um, so like all of the postures, plank is stira sukham asana and i talked about this before in an earlier video and it means strong steadfast and then in the plank more open rather than soft or happy the plank is a very open position and then the asana that we find that balance between strength and openness that enables us to in a sense sit in posture or enables in some ways the consciousness to be able to sit within the body in the posture because as we really focus on the demands that the plank places on our body and um, places on the, the focus that we have to bring to finding the balance of strength and openness the mind will most likely quieten and the consciousness is just there resting within the body for so long as the posture can last for so long as the asana can last and in the plank, that's possibly not going to be terribly long. More often than not, um, Chaturanga Dandasan is practiced in yoga as a transition posture. It's a transition between downward dog, Chaturanga Dandasana, and then Cobra Bhujangasana, or upward dog, Urdha Mukha Svanasana. Um, it's important though to understand Chaturanga Dandasana and how it really works because unless we really get the balance and we get the placement of strength and openness in Chaturanga Dandasana accurate, we won't be able to use the posture effectively as a transition posture. If we've got too much strength in the front of the chest and the biceps, it will be almost impossible for us to lift freely up into a back bend with an open chest um, and releasing over the front of the spine. And similarly, in a way, if we've got too much strength at the front of the body in the plank, uh, it would be difficult for us to lengthen back and up into Adha Sanasana that was looked at in the second day of this challenge. So today we're going to do a little bit of preparation for Chaturanga Dandasana, opening up in the hip flexors, which is part of the body that does need to be very open and long in the practice feeling length through the front of the abdomen at the same time as maintaining strength there. Thinking as well about the sense of lengthening through the legs from the inside of the hip joints towards the heels that we also need to, to practice in the plank in order to uh, keep the front of the body quite long. And we'll just work a little bit as well in getting the strength into the upper back. So let's begin by starting at the end of the mat, the back of the mat, and as we breathe in and breathe out, we're going to step, first of all, the right leg along the length of the mat. 
So ideally, the legs stay in line with the hip joint. So if I were to take two fists and run them between, between one heel and the other, that I would have that two fist distance. And then from here, on the inhalations, I'm going to come into a lunge like this, and on the exhalations, coming out. And the idea is that my spine is going to lift up from the tailbone to the crown in the centre, and that both legs are lengthening as evenly as possible away from the hip joint. So one obviously is lengthening in front of me, and one behind, whilst my body lifts up nice and tall in the centre, between the action of the legs. And you can either keep the back heel down and straighten up through the front leg and come back into the lunge, or as I tend to do, you can let that back heel lift away and then coming down into the lunge. And so as you lift away in either position, draw up through the kneecaps and the fronts of the thighs and the gluteal muscles. And also lift up from the base of the spine, navel pulling to the spine, lifting right up into the crown, and then again, keep the lift between the tailbone and the crown of the head as you let both legs lengthen away from either side of the base of the spine. And into this, we're going to just gradually think in terms of adding a little bit of an arm action. So as we move into this full position, so it's a Vinny Yoga version of Virapadrasana 1, Warrior or Hero Pose 1. It's the inhalation. And as we come out, it's the exhalation. And although we might perceive that the action of the posture is through the legs and through the arms, in fact, my posture in my mind is beginning at my tailbone and then traveling out through my pelvis into my legs, beginning at my tailbone, traveling up through my spine, through the trunk, and then arriving in my upper back and finally my arms. Let's do one more practice on the side. And then we're going to swap the legs around. So nice and tall again at the back of the mat. Breathing in and breathing out. Send the left leg forwards this time. And once again, that two fist distance if we were to run the hands between both heels. And just testing how much space you need. So these first two or three are where we're just figuring out how we can keep the spine as long as possible as we open up over the front of the back hip, let the inside leg lengthen back towards the inside of the heel, and on the front leg it's that sense of grounding into the front heel, so press down into the front heel whilst you let the inside of your leg lengthen a little bit away from the hip joint. And then gradually as you feel confident there, adding the arm movement in. So again, I take my mind to the base of my spine, I support my spine and release each vertebra away from the one below as I come into the movement. So I avoid letting my mind just simply be in my hands and in my feet. I try to bring my awareness into my whole body to create this practice. And in theory, although my back is arching just a little bit, so my abdominal muscles are stretching a little bit, I'm still working strongly in the front of the abdomen. In other words, I'm avoiding a position like this, where I've just let the separation between the ribs and the pelvis run away with itself. I'm holding on with a little bit of strength there, feeling that my upper back has to work and the back of my waist has to work to bring me into a strong, disciplined position. Last one. And breathing out. So then again, we're going to step back, bring the feet back together again. And the practice we've been working has been lengthening the spine, of course, and opening the fronts of the hips. I'm just going to think of a better version now of Ura Hastasana, which again was, requires the spine to stay quite long and the fronts of the hips to stay quite open. I'm going to try to use the banda that we've thought about in the other videos so far in the challenge, where we get that lift in the muscles directly in front of the tailbone and we hollow in the lower abdominal muscles. 
and we let the navel pull to the spine and also hook up towards the diaphragm and come back down. And with these movements, it's very key if you've got more or less a two fist distance between your feet and the heel so that your thigh bones are aligned with the bones of your pelvis. If you can, at the same time as you keep supporting your spine upwards like a stick, you have a sense of letting your legs move from the inside of the hip joints down towards the heels. So in the movement, of course, you need to pull up through your thighs, pull up through the backs of the legs and the gluteal muscles, but you also need to lengthen the legs downwards from the inner thigh. And this isn't a calf raise up and down, just in the back of the, the lower leg. It's the whole body working to lift, as we'll need the whole body working to support the spine in the, the plank position as well. So we need to engage the rib cage towards the spine, at the back, at the sides and the front. We need to engage the, the waist muscles towards the spine, at the back and the sides and the front, as well as these lifts in front of the tailbone in the lower abdomen, navel pulling to the spine. And then if we, we get quite practiced at Oda Hastasana, we add in an arm circulation and then return. So again, remember to support the, the trunk and then gradually pull up through your gluteal muscles, through the fronts and the backs of the thighs and let the calves and the feet be the last essentially to work. So now that one <laughs> was not such a good one. <laughs> It's like that. That's it back again now. And then we just do a last one. And then coming down with control. And sometimes the control on the return, the problem is not enough lift at the top of the back of the thigh. And maybe not enough lift in the gluteal muscles as well. But if you're pulling up strongly in the glutes and you're thinking, why can't I keep control here? Could be you're not getting quite enough lift at the top of the back of the thigh. So that's the standing work. We've had a look at that here. And then we're going to come down onto the mat to open up the fronts of the hips a little bit more as well ahead of the plank. So let's just bring ourselves through towards the all fours. And then we can breathe in to bring the right leg forwards and just getting a little bit of opening there over the front of the left hip. We can put some padding underneath the back knee if that helps us, folded blanket. But otherwise, just try to bring the weight of the thigh above the knee so you're not resting directly onto the kneecap, but you're coming a little bit more forwards. And in this position, we should, to really be able to open, get the pelvis to square up. So there'll be a tendency with this left hip to swing back and the right hip to swing forward because the body feels that it needs to stretch and open here. So it compensates um, to you know, not have to engage with what can be a very strong stretch. We can work on just giving ourselves uh, the space and the lightness in the body to align the pelvis again by raising the back leg. So as we breathe in, if we keep a powerful lift in the lower abdomen, the muscles around the waist engage so that the hips lift themselves and the waist lifts itself and the leg follows, then we need to draw back on the right hip, draw forwards on the left hip and coming back down. And ideally on the front leg, we keep the knee above the ankle so that front knee isn't taking too much strain. As we're trying to open over the front of the left hip, we need to remember that some of these muscles that we're opening begin right up here on the front of the spine and on the front of the pelvis. We need to lengthen the spine as well to get the most out of this. And if we're feeling pretty supple, you know, we may be just coming on through towards the floor. We may be, or we may not, we may be here, or we might be up here. We're still trying to keep the hips square. It's going to be a lot harder to raise that back leg 
if you've got your weight resting on the front thigh. So you might just be in a more static position here. So that's opened up on the left hip. And then let's release that leg and bring it back. And then as you're ready, breathing in to bring the left leg forwards instead this time. And the right leg is behind. So once again, the idea of either supporting the knee on a little bit of padding or making sure that we're resting that back leg on the thigh just above the kneecap, trying to again really draw that left hip back and the right hip forward to reach the hip flexor muscles that we're trying to target. And then from here, we're going to just work to lift up using lots of strength in the lower abdomen and around the waist drawing the left hip back, the right hip forward, lengthening our spine again between the tailbone and the crown, a very similar position to the one that we're actually going to be in in the plank in a minute. So again, it's that inhalation to use the abdominal strength, strength in the back of the waist, try to lengthen the spine between the tailbone and the crown, reach into the back leg if you can, again lengthening from the inside of the hip joint to the inside of the knee heel coming back down. And then the last one, just keeping this quite good alignment on that front leg as well. Good. So then we really stand and we can either rest here or as we did on the first side, if it feels reasonable, we can come on down into a much lower position. Or if it really doesn't feel as though that's where we should be, just lifting the position up a bit higher. You can hold it in this higher position all throughout the opening if that feels better. So breathing and then once again as you're ready let's send the hips back and towards the heels stretching out the lower back and having a rest in the Shashankasana hair pose. So Allowing the breath to soften, especially the exhalations to lengthen. You might let the shoulders soften here, let the collarbones stay open and the shoulder blades just gently slide out towards the sides of the rib cage. And if it feels a little bit hard to get the breath into the body, let the breath really move back. So you're filling the back of the chest with your breath. And on the exhalations, it's often very helpful in these um, child positions to pull the navel to the spine to help the breath to leave. And then we just do that last round of the breath here in the Shashankasana. We're gradually going to see whether it's possible to work on an upper back strengthening exercise here in the um, quite low folded onto the floor position. And to do that, we're going to let the hands lift up onto the fingertips as we try to draw the weight away from the fingertips. And in order to do that, we have to take a lot of strength into the lower abdomen again. So we need a powerful lift in the muscles directly in front of the tailbone and a powerful lift in the lower abdomen, the mulabandha strength. And also we need to pull the navel to the spine so that the weight of the hips and the lower back, you might be able to see, is just a little bit elevated away from my knees and away from my heels. And then here, if I work on my right side first, what I'm going to do is to keep my shoulder blade on the right side, pretty centered on the right side of the rib cage as I deliberately draw it down the back and use that drawing of the shoulder blade down the back to help me lift my right arm in this position. So if I've got a lot of weight in the hips and I'm not really supporting the midsection a little bit away from the legs, I'm gonna find this super difficult. It's not easy, uh, even as it is here, uh, but you do need that strength that there's a certain amount of bracing for the spine right back at the base of the spine. And I'm going to move on to the left arm so there's not too much weight in the fingertips at the outset before one arm lifts away. I keep that left shoulder blade sort of centered in the back of the ribcage. I draw it down the back and what's happening is that the muscles that connect into the shoulder blade into the back of the upper arm are working to, to 
connect into the shoulder blade as it moves down the back, it's that that's lifting the arm. And it's this strength between the back of the upper arm and the shoulder blade that we will need in the plank. Now, if it's really impossible back there in Shashankasana, come forward into the all fours and see whether it's possible. So we did something similar to this when we were practicing for the Adho Mukha Svanasana, the downward facing dog, in the second day of the challenge. Again, the shoulder blade moves down the back and there's a sense that the arm is lifted from out of the upper back strength. And, and then in any case, I suppose from here, we, we are a little bit closer to the plank position. But when we work that practice um, to support the arms in the upper back from the Shashankasana, it is more strengthening than it is here. So we're going to gradually approach the Chaturanga Dandasana practice itself now. We need to let the hands spread and open, so all the fingers fan outwards and the index fingers and the thumbs engage to the mat. And the arms should be this sort of width apart that I've got, so that they're the same width apart as my ribcage. If I draw the arms back, the inside of the arms just brushing on the sides of the ribcage. That's the width. Then going to let the shoulder blades be wide and move down the back and it's as if we're going to lift the arm but we don't and then let's just practice hovering away from the floor using the core strength mainly so in order for the legs to lengthen away from the pelvis in the plank position we need to initially support our lift from the floor not from the legs but from the core so this is again that same deep lift at the base of the spine, the lower abdomen lifting, navel pulling to the spine, and we're trying to support the hips upwards and away from the mat so that the legs hover at the end of the strength of the, or below the strength of the pelvis, below the strength of the core muscles in the abdomen. Shoulder blades wide, moving down the back and still keeping this work through the outside of the upper arm, connecting into the shoulder blade. So now of course we've got the weight in the hands. What people tend to do is to push into the floor for the strength. It's never going to work. You have to know where the floor is and then actually lift your body weight away from your hands and your wrists as much as possible. So from the little finger this pull up through the outside of the arm connecting into the shoulder blade. To get into the plank, the hands are going to have to come about one of our hands length in front of that all fours position. Then we need to, again, come back to that engagement that we practiced in the hair pose, connecting between the arms and the shoulders, keeping the shoulder blades wide and moving down the back. The back of the upper arm keeps working. We hover using the core strength. And now coming back to the idea that we had of the spine lengthening, Support the spine with the core, lower abdomen working. Waist works around the waist, backside front, ribs squeeze in, backside front. And your legs are lengthening from the spine through the inside of the hip joint, towards the inside of the knee, towards the heel. So your upper back is working, back of the ribs, back of the waist, gluteal muscles pulling up, back of the thighs are working, pulling up through the fronts of the thighs and breathing. Triceps working. And then coming back. And we send the hips back and towards the heels. And then as you're ready, rolling back up. So that's a very slow plank, of course. Um, but it really is the way to understand the strength of the back of the arms, across the upper back, back of the waist, gluteal muscles, backs of the thighs, fronts of the thighs do need to engage. Abdominal muscles need to be working, but as your upper back and back of shoulders are working, the collarbones and the chest are quite open and the insides of the arms are quite lengthened. And that's what enables us to go from a plank position into a cobra and from a plank position into a downward dog position. And we might just look at that flow. As we move from the plank, down onto the mat, we need to 
keep the strength of the plank still going. When the body arrives on the mat, if we just think, all right, here I am on the mat, safety, let go of all my strength, we, we won't be able to flow into a cobra. As we come down onto the mat, we need to hold on to the strength that we've already put in place in the plank so that we go on utilising the hard work of the plank. Um, so that's one of the reasons why it's very good to get used to our plank position being nice and strong. So again, I've got my hands just a little bit in front of my shoulder joints. I get my upper back muscles to work strongly. My shoulder blades are moving down the back and before I put the weight into my arms, I feel that I've got that connection between the back of the upper arm and the shoulder. I keep that there. I need to think in terms of hovering my hips using the lower abdominal strength. I need to keep the strength wrapping around my rib cage backside front, wrapping around my waist backside front, lower abdomen lifts, my legs are lengthening from the insides of the hip joints towards the knees. I pull up through the gluteal muscles, backs of the thighs, fronts of the thighs. So my body is long, I can push into the heels. As I come down, I hug the elbows into the side of my body, come down, keep hold of that strength over the back of the ribs, waist, hips. I'm going to open from the tailbone into the crown, hold on to the strength behind. So it's all that back strength still working. And then from there, I could lift back again plank. And if I wanted to, I could open back again, downward facing dog, keeping the length through the insides of the arms, working through the outsides of the arms, shoulder blades wide and moving down the back. And coming away. So it's very useful, hard work though it is, <laughs> to, to practice the plank in this way. And it, it's one of the, I think, quite well kept secrets in the yoga world, how to get an ease of transition between plank and cobra and back up and down again. So as we've already practiced Adho Mukha Skanasana in the challenge, I'm going to from here flow into the downward dog practice using that length through the inside of the arm, the work in the outside of the arm, upper back, spine nice and long. I'm going to make the transition down into the plank. From the downward dog, your hands and arms are already in front of the shoulder joint, so it's easy to come into the plank. We need to hug the arms in towards the sides of the body to arrive onto the mat, knees, chest, chin, and then keep the strength behind you in order to lift up using your back strength into the cobra. And from the cobra, we just flow back, hips to heels. So I'll work it through twice, you can watch it. <laughs> if you've watched the video before, you can obviously do it the first time. If you're not used to it, um, watch it the first time, then give it a go as you're ready on the second practice. So my hands are spread and open. The insides of the arms are the same width apart as my rib cage. As I breathe in, coming through towards the all fours, I'm already supporting the spine, with the deep lift at the base of the spine, the hollow in the lower abdomen and the navel pulling to the spine. I get that sense of connection between the back of my upper arm and the shoulder blade. Then I hover away using my deep abdominal strength. I stretch through the insides of the arms through to my thumbs and I lift my ribs out of my shoulders. Shoulder blades keep riding up the back. My ribs gather into my spine, my waist the same. Deep lift at the base of the spine. So then as I'm ready, just going to breathe in and then breathe out. I'm going to pull through towards the plank, keeping my upper back strong, still lifting my weight away from my wrists, tailbone dives away from the crown of my head. Keep the strength wrapping around your spine, dive down, lengthen up and forwards. Out breath, flow back and then up. So. Back down again, second practice, and as you're ready, inhalation to come forwards to the all fours, lift the strength away from the wrists, hover, lengthen right back, ears and arms coming in line, collarbones to the open, shoulder blades keep lifting, extend the spine, tailbone to crown, really support it, deep lift in the lower abdomen, navel pulling to the spine. As you're ready, breathing in, breathing out, lots of strength in the abdomen, and then here we are, plank. 
push back towards your heels, breathing in, breathing out, inhalation, keep working from behind, open forwards and upwards. And from there we'll roll down and send the hips back and towards the heels. You can let the arms relax, bring them alongside the legs, just breathing there, two or three breaths. So I hope that that was helpful. I hope it helped you to understand a little bit how the, the plank works. It is a very strong practice um, and requires a lot of energy, but as with most all of the yoga practices afterwards, um, although we've given up physical energy, we get this charge of pranic energy coming into the body. And it's quite, as I said before, a yang energy that comes from the chaturanga. I think we should just roll ourselves down onto the mat and just spend a few moments to relax, to absorb the energy of the practice we've just been in. Just allow the knees to be bent and the soles of the feet engaged towards the mat. Just in a very gentle way, we'll let the arms flow up and above us, just allowing the inhalation to deepen and lengthen as the arms travel up and back. And then again on the exhalation, allowing the arms to travel back towards the sides. And so we let the arms flow into this practice, just allowing the arms to keep flowing for so long as the inhalation comes into the body. At the point when the inhalation is at a comfortable fullness, it's letting the breath make the transition into the exhalation and again the arms travel back towards the sides, aiming to time the arrival of the arms at the sides with the end of the exhalation. Again there's a moment as the breath goes into transition and then again, allowing the inhalation to flow and the arms to travel for so long as the inhalation lasts. Again, at the top of the breath and at the top of the movement, there's a moment of transition, a moment of pause, and the exhalation comes back and the arms travel back towards the sides. Just let that flow through another couple of times, letting the mind rest as much on that moment of transition, that moment of stillness, as it engages with the time of action. exhalation as the arms come back to the sides, just allowing the body to move into that stillness of the transition between the two phases of the breath. Let the arms roll outwards at the sides. If it feels comfortable, the legs can just slide away and also roll outwards. Spending a few moments to let the body relax to now at the end of the practice certainly absorb the support that the earth has to offer from beneath. Letting the mind eye connect throughout all that length and breadth and depth of space that is the physical body. Just spending a moment to absorb the energy levels within the body at present, the quality of that energy. 
the energy levels within the mind at present and the quality of that energy. You might take a moment to observe the consciousness, the awareness, and any sense perhaps of our consciousness just simply at present being seated within the body and within the energy of the body. That unity, that oneness or wholeness here at the end of the practice, which is really the essence of yoga. Actually, again, bringing a little bit of movement back into the toes and into the feet and into the fingers and into the hands. Letting the breath adjust in length and speed again towards something more suited to movement, more suited to activity. And letting the senses open outwards again, sense of sight moving outwards again, sense of hearing moving into the wider distance and just knowing the sensations over the surface of the body, air on the skin, clothing on the skin, where the body begins and ends. It reaches stretch through the body, letting the muscles engage again all about the length of the spine, and all through the back, and stretching into the arms, stretching into the legs, just feeling all of the muscles throughout the body coming back into a state of activity again. And we can hug the legs in towards us, and just circling the hips on the mat two or three times one direction, and two or three times in the opposite direction. And then, is he ready? Just thinking about rolling over onto the side and then away from the side, rolling up towards a seated position. Om Shanti Namaste. Thank you for watching.